Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Sunday Assembly Sacramento. Let's get up on our feet. Everybody, welcome. How are you guys doing today? Uh, for those of you who are new, Sunday Assembly is a secular congregation. Uh, we are here to celebrate life, and as our posters say, we are here to learn how to live better, help often, and wonder more. And we do that all together by doing those things, by helping each other out, by learning about science and the world around us, by the one life that we have to live, and figuring out how we can make this a better place for other people. Uh, and one of the ways that we do that is by providing free child care. So way on the other side of the building is, who's back there right now? Uh, uh, Diana and... Uh, Lucila. And let's applaud for them so they can hear us. Another way that we help out is by having throughout the month all kinds of little events. And uh, like our parenting smoop, for example. So how about a round of applause for those people who are running some smoops? And for all the people who were here this morning and last night, uh, setting up all the chairs, the table, the coffee, the donuts, the tablecloths, the programs. Let's give them a round of applause. And if you haven't noticed, the Reason Center looks a little bit better today, thanks to the lovely talents of Amber, who has put decorations all across the place. How about a round of applause for her? Uh, Amber actually has a whole business doing wedding design and party stuff and making your place look better and so her business cards are scattered across the place pick one up and help her out um, i want to thank the reason center for letting us use their venue yet again for the ninth time plus all the little meetings that we've had in between the reason center is a great place if you ever want to have an event somewhere here uh, because they all open it up to anybody and if you want to use one room or the whole room and have like a birthday party some special event for whatever group it is it doesn't even have to be a secular organization uh, there are there's uh, flyers in the front lobby about using the Reason Center. And if you've got a couple extra bucks and you want to support the Reason Center so that groups like ours can meet here, uh, I encourage you to do that too. Um, so, I'd like to introduce to you our MC for the, for the program uh, and board member. Uh, Janet has been with us since the beginning, and when we all sat down to figure out what we were going to do about programs and different days, right off the bat, she's like, I've got May because I have a plan for May. And so here to tell us about her plan and a little bit more about what we're going to talk about today, let's welcome board member Janet May. singing. Um, the first song represented me and my friends. I could just see us dancing in our bedrooms to that song and singing along and to be able to come decades later to do it. And, it was so much fun. and then Elton John was like the guy from me through my high school, the Crocodile Rock. Another, see for those of you who are younger, we would have this thing called Turntable and you had a record player and you put thing on it. And when you wanted to sing it over and over again, you had to lift the needle up and get it the beginning of the song and then repeat it over and over again. And you'd be in your room with your raggedy and looking at you and having a great time. So anyway, uh, there's a lot of revival going on and I noticed Joseph, it's very funny to see, like, he's one of our speakers, his mom is there. And these are songs she knows, and he he sings, yeah. and, and he's just smiling. But I'm like, you, I don't think you did. You give it a little try. Nah. <laughs> he does hip hop. Yeah. Ah, all right. Well, we may have one of our songs up here be hip hop. That would be great. Okay. So you see this lovely scarf I'm wearing. Well, the idea is that when you see this lovely scarf I'm wearing, people will say, "Oh, it's a lovely scarf you're wearing." Tell me, oh, about your lovely scarf. That's of course not what people do. They say that's the most garish thing I've ever seen. However, this color is the color that is chosen as part of a campaign to get people talking about mental health challenges. We talk about mental health, we talk about mental illness. We're not really sure, a lot of us, what it really means. And quite frankly, it's very broad. We have two speakers today. One of them is going to talk about when the disorder attacks you in a biochemical kind of way. And the other speaker is going to talk about how Sometimes situations can create the same sort of pain in the brain, but that's the idea. It's a pain you cannot see. And so the green, it's just to let people know that many of us know people, and we're there for them, and we're, I'm an advocate. I'm the chairperson of Classic County's Mental Health Board, so these are issues I care about a lot. But you can't see people if they're suffering. And I just think this thinking on the drive here of all the people with them, breast cancer, when they survive, we got their big pink 
t-shirts that say survivor. So maybe someday we'll get to a point where people are wearing green t-shirts that say I survived or I'm on the road to what we call recovery because too often in the news you only know about the people who get attention for all the wrong reasons. So with that, I'm going to introduce you to Wendy Wurtenberger and she can step on up. And she is uh, going to tell you who she is, but she's uh, the coordinator of the Placer County Speakers Bureau. And she helps people tell their stories. And she's going to introduce our first speaker. Thank you so much, Janet. Well, very happy to be here today. And I just wanted to briefly let you guys know that um, we definitely have programs in Placer County and all over the place. So there's resources everywhere. Nobody needs to suffer in silence, and nobody needs to be embarrassed about this kind of thing. Again, uh, my job is basically client speakers who have uh, been through challenges in their life and want to discuss that with people in the community. So we want to basically sh kind of shed the stigma and, and let people know that uh, people recover from mental illness and they lead productive lives and you know, go on to do very great things in society. So uh, with that, we'll have Pat come up and share your personal story. I grew up in an average family. I was actually a black kid and a decent student. I joined the Army right after high school graduation, totally believing that the uh, Army slogan, be all you can be. I stayed in two years, one month, and 24 days, discharging with the diagnosis of PTSD. I actually found out that the Army was a man's army. I immediately jumped into college where my major was criminal justice after leaving the, the military. I wanted to be a lawyer then. But while I was in college, my concentration began to disappear. I began to hear voices telling me that I was nobody, that I was never going to make it in life, and I became so depressed I could not even get out of bed. Losing, losing control of your mind is very scary. It attacks your, your total being. It impacts and influences everything, how you act, it, what you believe. I never thought it would happen to me. At the age of 30, not 20, like statistics, but the age of 30, I was diagnosed with bipolar disorder and PTSD. A chemical imbalance in my brain, it distorted my perception of me and my environment, which included <laughs> this was after many years of drinking myself into oblivion to manage my mental health symptoms. Drinking was everything to me. It cured my bipolar disorder. It animated me even more than I'm animated now. <laughs> and it was the plaster to the many cracks of my PTSD. It started right away this love affair from the very first drink. As that warm confidence slipped down my slipped through my veins, I thought, so this is how the normal person feels. I could not imagine a life without alcohol. It was my everything until it ripped me apart. I was in and out of the hospital and day treatment, which they don't have today, for a while. I was probably hospitalized about five times, I guess five, it could be six, but I was 51, 50, five to six times during that period. As the voices came and went, my moods, they were swinging up and down. Sometimes I felt so good that I was in denial about my illness, of course, until the symptoms returned. But what I later found out was that was a symptom of my diagnosis, to think that I was all right. I was so tired of treatment at that point, tired of stigma, I felt from accessing community resources. But this is where my story turns around. My recovery journey began in 2004, not too long ago after a six-month rehab stay, and it was focused on co-occurring disorders. Instead of just treating the, the um, alcohol abuse, it was abuse, it wasn't addiction, and the mental health disorder, they, were, they did that together. We do have programs like that now, probably one. <laughs> okay, going back to my life was the hardest thing I've ever done. How to be a mom without wine. How to socialize without my liquid courage how to figure out who I am and what, I was, what did I want from life. Day by day, my real self 
emerged. I got through some rough times without my liquid crutch, but more importantly, more importantly, I learned how to navigate everyday life totally present through every emotion, boredom, resentment, anger, sadness, joy, and even celebration. I started creating my own recovery network, which still helps me to this day. I created all different forms of therapy, <laughs> believe it or not. I love to take walks. The color of nature just tends to bring me joy. I do a lot of reading, which keeps my mind busy. I go to all kinds of lectures, workshops, you name it. I do it, whether they're related to me or not. I just love information. Um, I do fundraising, life coaching, and advocacy work. And I do volunteer a lot. I love the homeless. I love the mentally ill. I love, I love domestic violence. I mean, I have the cause out there. Okay? <laughs> the more problems, the better. Okay? Talking to other people and helping them, it also helps me. Because I tend to think outside the box. What I think about my life today, I think about Johnny Nash's song. I can see clearly now the rain is gone. Because 10 years ago, my life was stormy. Today, I still take medication. I see a counselor when I need to talk. Actually, I see her once a week. I have a psychiatrist to handle my meds, and I have a built-in support system of peers. I am so happy today because I know that I am not alone anymore. I learned basic coping skills, basic coping skills from my case managers and a family who set firm boundaries, as well as from other consumers who had experiences in the mental health system. They taught me how to advocate for myself, and that was a, a very important piece to my recovery, learning how to get my needs met. Their help was so important in my recovery process, it made me want to give something back. I started telling my own story. <laughs> Amazingly, I found that this, is, this not only inspired others, but helped my own recovery. I found this a little bit of everything that helped me the most, not just medicine, not just therapy, not just financial stability, buying a house, getting a car, getting married, having a relationship, and having kids. It's all important to have and to work on, and it's different for everybody that suffers from a mental disorder. Recovery, I found, is an individual thing. I have found that no one can tell you how to do it. The important thing is to know that you can. Education in itself is a powerful motivator for me. I am a therapist intern right now working towards becoming licensed, and I continue to work as a mental health counselor specializing in addiction for the county, and I greatly enjoy my job. My mental illness has been a challenge, but it has taught me a lot about myself, and I appreciate what my experiences also offer my clients. I have found my heart in recovery. I opened a um, private practice, a positive option, about three years ago, believe it or not, three years ago, and this mission is to reach out to those still struggling and celebrate recovery, because we do recover. We heal, we find ourselves. We learn to sit through every emotion, resist the urge to alter or numb our feelings. I laugh today right from the heart. I don't shape shift to please people anymore. I cry real genuine tears, not drunk and self-centered crocodile tears. And I have found <coughs> peace, love and acceptance in recovery that I searched for for years. In closing, mental illness can affect anyone and it takes a serious toll on people, their families, our communities, and society at large. While I've had the blessings of family, friends, and communities that support me in my recovery, not all who face such challenges do. This is a mindset that needs to change. A responsibility not only of people with mental illnesses, but also of their families, their mental health care providers, their friends, their employers, teachers, and more importantly, our communities and society at large. Each and every person deserves the opportunity and the freedom to live a happy and mentally healthy life. So with that, I encourage all of you to please be aware of ourselves and of others and lend an open ear and have an open mind. Together, we can create a community a positive mental health, progress, and involvement. So together, let's promote mental health, acceptance, and dignity for all. 
as a testimony to my own recovery. I have earned two master's degrees, one in human services and one in mental health counseling, to remind myself of, of those days when I could not concentrate. One degree was to heal myself. <laughs> it's sad to say, it was to heal myself. And I went back to school and got a master's in counseling to learn how to do all those evidence-based counseling approaches integrated with my faith system to heal myself, because it just wasn't, it's still not really out there. Uh, and then, then I went back to school. <laughs> Again, I got one in human services, a master's degree in human services, so I to help my clients learn how to identify, access their needs in the community. I, my journey down the road of life, it had many twists and turns. The road I chose had lots of bridges, of which most of them I burned. Although at times the road seemed rough, one thing is very clear. No matter how hard or how long it took, my journey led me right here. As a famous quote from Albert Einstein said, states, everything is energy, and that's all there is to it. Match the frequency of the reality you want, and you cannot help but get that reality. It can be no other way. This is not philosophy. This is physics. Thanks. <laughs> That was wonderful. Thank you so much, Pat. And I'd like everyone, if you have a program, just to turn it to the inside uh, for just a moment. I want to point out that there's a number of resources available uh, that we've brought together there for you, including uh, a number of staggering statistics about mental health that you'll see on the right-hand side, uh, provided by NAMI, that's the National Alliance on Mental Illness. So please, when you get a chance, uh, take this home with you and keep it somewhere where you can get to it if you need it. Uh, for yourself or for someone else. Uh, another person that I have had the honor to hear speak is a young man named Joseph Torres, and he came to, I'm a member of a, a group called uh, Campaign for Community Wellness, and everybody in your county, you have a steering committee that decides how to spend millions and millions and millions, and probably more millions in Sacramento than Placer, yeah. of dollars for mental health care and services that affect all groups from youth to adults, and they're always looking for ways to meet underserved populations. And one of those groups they're really trying to work on is the idea that young teenagers go through a lot of stuff alone, and a lot of the behaviors we just think, oh, they're moody, they're this, they're that. We downplay a lot of what young people go through. We call that transition age youth, and they've been on the, uh, we've been listening to them more and more, and when I say me, the whole world of people who care about all this stuff, and the nice thing is, when you ask them, they're very willing to tell you. So in our segment called Doing His Best, I would like to introduce Joseph Torres, and he's going to tell you a little bit about how he took his experiences to come to discover a thing right now that's very big in his life, hip-hop music. And with that, Joseph, come on up. Thank you, guys. Um, well, as you already know, my name is Joseph Torres, and uh, I come from Auburn, as you can tell by my shirt. <laughs> <laughs> Auburn's where my heart is. I wouldn't be, wouldn't imagine myself being anywhere else. Um, let's 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 get into this real quick. Um, with my experiences when I was a little kid, around 10, 11 years old, in elementary school, I experienced this worldwide phenomenon that's going on called bullying. And uh, I was around, I was in uh, fifth grade, I want to say, and uh, I want to say, like, throughout that whole year of fifth grade, each day that went by, there wasn't a single day where I wasn't picked on. I was picked on in the classroom, I was picked on in the hallways, I was picked on on the playground, I was picked on everywhere. Uh, reasons I was picked on, who knew? These people, like, they, they found any reason in the world to pick on me. Was it because I was a boy? Sure. Was it because I was smaller than them? Sure. Was it because I wasn't as smart as them? Of course. Yeah. Um, so, each day that went by getting bullied, you know, um, I started feeling these feelings of sadness, these feelings of anger, these feelings of despair. 
and uh, I didn't ha I didn't have anybody there. I mean, no matter how many tra how many times I tried to reach out to my friends, they backed out because they didn't want any part of it. They were afraid that my problems would become their own, and so they left me alone to deal with it myself. And um, I never really tried to go to a teacher, even though I should have. I never went to my parents, even though I should have. I was that kind of person that kept my problems bottled up inside. And with that, that's not a good thing to do because that just developed more problems. And one of those problems was suffering from depression and feeling insecure about myself. And um, while getting bullied, like maybe halfway throughout the year, this was probably when I was at my boiling point and uh, I was at the height of my depression and my insecurities and I started thinking thoughts, really, really bad thoughts about suicide. Mind you, this is when I was around 10, 11 years old in elementary school in fifth grade. And so, you know, I thought about attempting suicide. I tried once, but never went through with it because as I was about to go through with it, a little light came on in my brain and I had a voice speak to me and this voice told me don't do it you you have a purpose in this life of yours and you need to find out what it is you need to keep moving forward not moving step three steps back and so I listened to that voice I was like alright I'm not gonna do it and so Throughout the, re the final half of the year of getting bullied, I made it through that year. And, uh, you know, I was still suffering from depression and insecurities that I felt from getting bullied. And uh, so, fifth grade ended. It was the summer. And I was just sitting in my room and I was thinking of ways to express what happened, express what I went through, express everything I was feeling. And, you know, one of the only things I could think of was writing. And so, to, to transition into my next, my next part of my story, I started writing around 12, 13 years old. And so, uh, at first I was just writing random stories, okay? And these were like off-the-wall, random, ridiculous stories that you would ever hear. And uh, so it started off with writing stories, so it started with creative writing, so coming up with different kinds of stories and topics. And uh, then it around, I want to say around seventh grade, it transitioned into songwriting because me and two other friends of mine, we had this I idea, the, the most ridiculous idea to start a band. And uh, we wanted to be like a progressive rock band at first. And so I was like, all right, I'm down. And they made me the lead singer of the band. And so I was like, all right, I guess I, I can do it. And so I was in charge of writing the songs for the band. And so I would write a whole bunch of just random songs. And I noticed within each line of each song that I wrote, they were rhyming. And I'm like, all right, this could be cool. And so speed forward a little bit to the end of eighth grade, the band idea failed. <laughs> Go figure. Um, and so, but but my like my thirst for writing songs never went away. And so I just kept writing and writing and writing. And so transition into high school and sophomore year, I started writing hip hop music because I heard the music of Eminem. Uh, I heard Mockingbird, the song he wrote for his daughter. And so that really brought light that there is good hip hop out there. And then I heard music from other artists. And so I was just like, you know what? I'm gonna write my own hip hop music. And so um, writing my own hip hop music has really helped pull me away from depression, pull me away from stress, pull me away from anger. It's pulled me away from all the negative aspects of life. And so, you know, whenever I'm feeling stressed, I sit down and write. Whenever I feel depressed, I sit down and write. Whenever I feel angry, I sit down and write. And so, writing my own hip-hop music has really helped me pull myself out of the darkness. And so, transition a little bit into 2011, I met with Auburn Hip-Hop Congress, and I joined 
their group, and I became more involved within my community, performing at shows, volunteering at events, uh, just really trying to get out in my community and trying to make a difference with what I'm doing with my music and my spare time at the same time. So basically, writing music was my therapeutic outlet to get out of the darkness from being bullied and feeling depressed and insecure. And with music, it really helped me grow and it helped me develop as a human being at the same time. I, I never really saw myself performing on stages in Sacramento and Auburn, Roseville, Rockland, name it, I've been there. Um, so with what I'm doing with my music, what I'm doing my best at is I'm trying to use my journey and express it within my music and really put it out to the world so people can hear my message and hear about my journey and it can help them through it. And what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to bring conscious hip hop to the table because conscious hip hop is what I call my music. Conscious hip hop is the hip hop that the artist expresses his struggles with life, the trials and tribulations he's gone through, the challenges he's had to conquer. And so that's what I'm trying to bring back is conscious hip hop because that's the hip hop that I like to listen to. That's the hip hop that I want to be heard. And so with that, I'm in the process of finishing my own first project called the Therapeutic Mindset EP. And what I want people to take away from the project is that, yes, we all have tough struggles with life, but there's always a light at the end of the tunnel, and everything in the end always gets better. And that's my time. Thank you, guys. Before I go, <laughs> I'm going to bless you guys with a verse from one of the songs on my EP on my CD, and uh, this is the song that I wrote about bullying, and uh, this is the first verse from the song, and hopefully I don't butcher it, so let's, let's find out how I do it. Let's see, it goes like this. <clears throat> you know, nowadays, it never really surprises me when a kid won't go to school because of some problems with a bully. Getting picked on all the time, it really takes a toll on you. I'm only speaking about it because it's something I went through. Constantly shoved in hallways, getting called all sorts of names, it felt like torture it felt like torture to me, but to them it was all fun and games. It messed me up mentally, it hurt me a lot emotionally. Both of those elements combined led up to a bad probability. It felt like a living nightmare and I just wanted it all to end. I was scared to go to an adult and I couldn't tell any of my friends. I was all by myself facing these issues all alone. I wonder what would have happened if other people would have known. But now I'm all grown up and I made it through it all. I chose to become a musician because music helps me stand tall. Writing is my therapy, that's how I escape through the day, but there's other outlets to explore. Writing isn't the only way. Yeah, I'm not going to follow that. <laughs> Uh, Joseph's business cards are also scattered across the room, front and back, um, and I looked last night, I saw you're on Twitter, but it's like a private thing, so I don't know if you're looking for followers, uh, can they get you on Facebook or something like that? Or? Yeah, you can find me on Facebook and Twitter. Awesome, awesome. And then this whole group, the Hip Hop of Congress, they can search mm -hmm. for that too? Yes, we're on Facebook. That's Excellent. like Excellent. the only one we've got so far. <laughs> and YouTube, yeah. awesome. Yes. Awesome. Alright, we've heard a lot today. Um, about mental health and what we need to do now is give ourselves a couple moments just to think about that and uh, the messages that we've heard and how that affects our own lives. So uh, let's start our moment of reflection and uh, just think a little bit, get some quiet in here. There we go. All right, thank you. So uh, I want to just express some thanks again to everyone who's contributed to Sunday Assembly the last uh, nine months that we've been around. Uh, your financial support uh, has, has kept us afloat, uh, and I'd love to see that continue on. And for anyone who isn't aware, um, we do pay a small amount to rent the room each month, uh, a small amount on Facebook, which is maybe how some of you came here today. Um, child care, uh, although we do have volunteers back there, we have to continually put coloring books and other kids' activities 
Uh, we pay for the meetup website, and we're uh, still paying off that incorporation fee of uh, 400, and, I think it was 400 dollars. Uh, so that we can be an official nonprofit 501c3 organization. So some hats are going around. You know the drill. If you can, great. If you can't, don't worry about it. Um, and if you want to later on, you can also donate to our website. And all of our financial information is up on there too. While that's happening, you guys know how this goes. We like to do some icebreakers. And it's, it's come to my attention that maybe rock, paper, scissors, we've outgrown that a little bit. So, so we're going to do that one more time. Uh, but if you have ideas, then bring them to me. Email me on Facebook, meet up, whatever. Let me know after the event. Wow. All right. Um, I want to thank again all the donors. I want to thank the music and program committee, especially Janet, for putting together a wonderful program today. Let's thank her and all of our speakers. On the back page of your program are upcoming events, and I have just the most important announcements you can ever announce. Uh, starting next month, starting June, we're moving to the second Sundays. Today is, has always been on the third Sunday, so we'll see you in three weeks, is what I guess, I guess I'm saying. Um, so update your calendars, your phones, your Googles, and whatever else. Uh, so remember, we're, we're going to be here the second Sunday of each month, starting next month. Um, next week, uh, some of us are going to go and have a little field trip and uh, head down over to the East Bay Sunday Assembly. And so if you want in on that, uh, there's an event on the meetup page. Uh, some folks are going to take the Amtrak and make like a whole day out of it. Other folks are just going to go and carpool or whatever else. And so if you want in on either of those, um, well, let me just see. Ra raise your hand right now if you're kind of thinking about maybe doing that. All right, very cool. So you can see who each other kind of is, but definitely go to the website and uh, RSVP for that. Um, we've got a hike coming up next, sun, uh, next Saturday. Uh, anyone here going to that hike, Folsom Lake and Granite Bay? Yeah, a couple people here. Excellent. Maybe going like this. How difficult is that hike? Easy. We're taking our kids. Okay. Our two-year-old. Okay. <laughs> two-year-old stamp of approval. <laughs> so I might be able to, is what you're saying. Okay. <laughs> All right, um, so there's that, there's the Secular Parenting Group in Ashton Park, and again I want to remind everyone that if you want to start your own monthly kind of thing, whatever it is, whether it's a parenting thing, a hiking thing, a, a monthly thing at the movies, board games, or whatever it is, book club, uh, let me know, get in touch with me, or just do it up on the website on meetup.com, and anyone here, everyone here can, can suggest a site, and I can make it monthly recurring like that. Um, so if you're interested in that, please uh, let me know. And for any other events uh, of a secular nature in the Sacramento area, please visit Sacramento Core, that's C-O-R dot org, for the Coalition of Reason here in Sacramento. Um, I think that's everything. If you're not following us already on Facebook or, or Twitter or Meetup, please do so. And thank you, Janet. Uh, today, after our whole potluck thing, um, there's a uh, special thing going on at the Crocker. Anyone can get in for any donated amount. So you basically pay your own price and they'll let you in, and that's pretty awesome too. Um, so after our final song, in just a second, remember to stick around and mingle and be social, make some new friends with our potluck. Um, after we're done singing, all of the purple chairs, just put them by the wall. All of the green chairs, just stay put where you are. So everyone knows what chair you're in? Okay, so green chairs are gonna go by the wall. I mean, purple chairs by the wall. <laughs> Almost. Purple chairs by the wall, green chairs stay where they are, and then uh, William's going to get some help, uh, hopefully, uh, for, to bring some tables out here. Uh, again, Amber, thank you for the decorations. Joseph, thank you also, uh, and Pat, thank you for that great performance as well. <laughs>